Well folks, we've done a lot of these videos in the past and we're gonna do another one. My Uncle Mike just shot this bull here in New Mexico. And as often the case, it's on a steep slope. It's kind of dirt and debris and grass. It's late. We don't have much light left. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do the gutless method using the new Gerber exchange blade system. So very often you'll want to cape an animal. And Mike said, no, I'm not gonna to want to cape this, but that's the most difficult thing to do is a gutless method salvaging the cape. So I'm gonna show you the hardest possible way to do it. Now understand, there is no right or wrong way. You're gonna see videos that say start here, some that say start there. I always say start with the pieces that are easiest. In other words, if this bowl is underneath a brush pile and all you have access to is the hindquarters, start with the hindquarters. Or if you have some situation where the way he's laying, it's easier to just do the front quarters, start with the front quarters. There is no right or wrong way. There's just certain cuts that you have to do to make sure that you get every bit of salvageable meat you possibly can. A couple things you'll need to be aware of as you see us doing this. Know what the requirements are in the state you're hunting for proof of or evidence of sex. In many states, just having the head and the antlers in your pack is not evidence of sex. So, we're gonna start, I'm gonna really quick show you the diagram of how the cuts are gonna work, and then we're gonna get after it. Whenever you're going to do the gutless method and you wanna save the cape because your taxidermist will need it, you need to start with a dorsal cut down along this long mane all the way back as far as your taxidermist needs this. And from there, you just start taking the quarters. So as I get ready to do each of these, I'm gonna show them to you. Because this bull is uphill, I'm gonna start with the hind quarter on the top side. So I prefer to do it with the head uphill. Some people prefer to do it with the elk laying parallel, or like along the hillside. There's no right or wrong way. Just make sure you know what the steps are and how to do them. So you're gonna have a lot of people who give you the idea that you have to leave the skin on or you gotta take the skin off. It's whatever your preference is. Usually on the top side, I take the skin off. Just You'll see that I make this cut that comes down through here, down there, and that allows me to skin everything away all the way back here. And what I want to do is keep this elk in this same position so that once I get the skin off, I don't get a ton of dirt on him. So I'm going to test and see just, yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere. And usually what I do on my very first hind quarter that I do, that's the hind quarter where I keep the proof of sex. So with this hind quarter, I can tell right here, you can feel this, this pelvic bone, the, the right, anything north of here, if you wanna say north, is backstrap. Anything behind this is going to be the hind quarter. So I'm gonna make a cut all the way down along here just like this and that's going to take all this hide off here and then I'm going to be able to work underneath them and you see right now I'm using the serrated blade the serrated blade is always easier on leather and it preserves your other cutting blades in a in a way that keeps it away from hair from dirt and bone so usually when I'm taking the hide off I'm going with a serrated blade and the beauty of the exchange blade system, quick as I don't need it, I take this off and I get one of my regular cutting blades and start doing my work on the meat.
taken care of right here. Keep that attached. So now that I have evidence of sex remaining on this hind quarter, I'm going to have Mike lift up on it and I'm going to cut away right here. And you're going to see that right in about there, there's a joint, a hip joint going to allow this quarter to come apart way easier than you probably thought. This is his hip socket. Okay, he has a ball joint socket just like you and I. And this tendon right here, when I cut that, it's going to allow this entire hind quarter to release. You ready? You see that? All of a sudden, that was the linchpin. That's what holds that hind quarter from collapsing. Now, all I have to do, voila, once that pops, then you can roll this all the way forward. And you just keep doing it. going along the pelvic bone so you see there's no meat being wasted so you see this pelvic bone right here it's all I'm doing is just filleting along the pelvic bone being careful not to jab in there that Kind of defeats the purpose of, purpose of the gutless method. So right, right here where I'm at is the top of the pelvic bone. You hear that, that noise right there? And all this weight is going to fall on cameraman Dale here in about a second. And there you have hind quarter. It has evidence of sex attached. So, this is usually one of the hardest parts of the whole thing. I decided to do this hind quarter first because he was laying on his back or, or laying head uphill. If it would have been a different direction, I probably would have done the dorsal cut and done the front shoulder first. So what I'm going to do now, since he's laying there, you kind of do the top side, you roll them, and then you do the other side. So I'm going to do this dorsal cut right now, and that's going to allow me to swap over to one of my cutting blades rather than just use this serrated edge the whole time. So you get right between the ears and you'll quickly find out this is some really tough leather. And this is where your knife starts getting dull on a traditional blade. You'll see this serrated edge just boom, goes right through it. And anyone who knows how tough the leather is on an elk's neck knows that that's a good place for your blade 
to really take a beating. So the serrated blade helps protect you or protect your other blades so that when you get down to the meat, you're really gonna be able to do that easily. So what I'm doing, I'm just staying along the top of the spine all the way down to here. And it's gonna take me back to this joint where I took the hind quarter off. Now, depending on how much hide you want to leave your taxidermis, you can just take this whole thing forward. So right up here from this forward is the neck that transitions into the back straps all the way back to the hind quarter. Well, in order to get all of that and get to it the way you really should, you got to get this front quarter off first because it protects this part of the back strap. And if you're in a situation where you're going to do a shoulder mount, even though we're not going to do a shoulder mount on this elk, I told you that we're going to salvage the cape. What you would do, you'd talk to your taxidermist. Some taxidermists say, okay, come right up the bottom, do a T cut down here, and just skin the back of the legs and you're good. Some taxidermists say, skin this all, only to here, and then pop this hoof through, so you just end up with a pocket here. It's less for them to sew. Talk to your taxidermists, whatever they want before. So one of the reasons that this package, this exchange blade system, comes with a serrated blade is the serrated blade will take more tissue off the hide and has far less likelihood of cutting a hole in the hide. So when I'm going to cape something at this point, I'm still using the serrated blade. Now if I wasn't worried about the cape, I'd probably switch over to one of my cutting blades by now. The serrated blade will let you put quite a bit of pressure on this and you'll get by with it. Whereas with a traditional sharp cutting blade, there's a really good chance you're going to cut a hole in it if you put that much pressure on it. So here we have an exit wound on the front shoulder. That's going to make for some interesting uh, cleanup work on that front shoulder. Now I'm going to start back here.
you don't want to have the penis sheath and all that mass down there attached to your cape so I'm gonna cut that cape probably right about here so I've just cut myself a couple hand holes here on the part of the cape I know I'm not gonna use we're getting closer this is where you run a high risk of cutting a cape whether it's an elk deer antelope whatever and that's why I'm always trying as much as I can to go parallel to the hide and perpendicular to the meat but you don't want to make big gouges in the meat if you can help it you want to keep your meat clean If I wasn't going to salvage this cape, I would have done this completely differently. I would have started right down here, and I would have cut kind of like this. Here, and then back through here, and all the way back. And I would have worked the hide this direction. And I would have had all of this exposed as the first part of this operation. And it would have made for a much cleaner and easier thing to do. Anytime you're going to salvage a cape, know that you're going to have a lot more hair on your meat. And when you get home, you're going to have to do a bunch of cleanup. Just what you got to do. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go right to the brisket, make a cut here, and Dale's going to lift that front leg up and over, and you're going to see it's going to come off. Some people think you need saws and stuff to do all this. This is all soft tissue that connects this. Now some people will also try to keep most of the meat attached to the front quarter, and they'll go right down along the rib bone. Some people like to do a rib roll. So they'll take the minimal amount of meat to the hind quarter or the front quarter and leave most of it to the rib roll. It doesn't matter, whatever you prefer. So with this one, I'm going to take most of the meat with the front quarter. see there's a shot that you when you hit an elk you just you're gonna have some cleanup to do whether it's a front shoulder or wherever you hit them so tomorrow in the daylight we're gonna show you how to bone this and clean it up and do everything right because the meat is very important it's the reason we do this Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take all this neck meat, this brisket, I'm gonna take all this back strap, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna get the tenderloins before we roll them over. And uh, I'm gonna do that 
with one of these other blades. I probably could have swapped these blades out earlier, but when I'm working on hide, I like to save as much of my blade as I can because there's a few things that will ruin a blade. Hair, dirt, bone, and hides have a lot of both, dirt and hair. You can see this bull's been all mudded up while he's been rutting. And uh, that, that's just hard on blades. So my real carving tool, there's two different sizes of these in the package. One, some people prefer shorter, some prefer longer. I want to get down and along the spine when I do this back strap. And I prefer a longer blade for that. So I've changed blades and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a cut all the way along this side of the spine because I want to get this back strap off here all the way up to the neck. Just that whole piece. And the ribs curve underneath it so it kind of sits in here with this angle and that angle and just do that and you'll see it works pretty darn slick. Fine. It's pretty easy to find where the spine is, especially on a bull that's in the post rut phase because they don't have much fat left. And right here is that bone that I told you is the pelvic bone. So the back strap comes forward of that. And you just keep it right up against the spine and you'll be fine. go that's been cut away from the spine now I'm gonna make a little slice here and this will I'll be trimming eventually down here I want to show you You can see how this muscle known as the loin or the back strap sits up here. Be careful right here because there's no ribs there. Don't go like that. And once you get to the ribs, then you're a little safer. You gotta try pretty hard to puncture a hole in there. So once I get started, I usually come to the back here. Just be real gentle right there. I know I've got that bone right there. Right here is the pelvic bone. Just while you're near this stomach, just be careful. There's usually very little in the stomach that will enhance the flavor of your meat. Now I've got this end disconnected. I'm just gonna fillet it off the ribs all the way forward. Right there is a huge stretch of loin. There'll be some trim up here. 
but this will all be loin. And you can see that there is just nothing left here but spine and vertebrae. So now you're going to see me trim anything that isn't bloodshot. I'm going to start up here. I'm going to get a bunch of the neck meat. I'm going to come down. I'm going to get the brisket. I'm going to get a bunch of the rib meat. I mean, there's some holes. There's two shots here in the ribs. So that's going to require a little bit of work, some of the flank. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to get the tenderloins on this side before we roll him over. And then we're going to repeat the whole process on the other side and we're going to be done. What we are going to do tonight, it's going to get down in the 20s. We're going to hang the meat in these trees and then we're going to come back tomorrow and get anything, probably the four quarters. We're going to come back and we're going to bone them and show you how to do that. And then we'll be ready to head home. So one thing you'll see is right here, there's two bullet holes. So unfortunately, between bone fragment, bullet fragment, and bloodshot meat, we've salvaged pretty much all we can out of this section here. And now I'm gonna go do what we call the tricky part. And that is going to be getting the tenderloins out from the top. You'll notice being very careful here. I'm trying to remove this membrane so that I can get my hand up there and just carve them off the bone up there. So when you do this, make sure you don't go this way and puncture the gut. So we kind of spun the bowl this way so that it would relieve some of the pressure that was on this muscle. All those guts going right there makes this job harder. And once you get your hand in there, push down so that you can push the stomach away from your blade. And just be as careful as you can. And now you'll put your hand in there and you'll feel where it comes all the way back here and connects right there. What we're talking about is it's right underneath the spine up to here. It's this what, what you see I have right here. This is what we're trying to get out all the way back to where it connects right there. So if you ask, ask 10 people how to do this, expect about 15 different answers. I go on the top and go as far up as I can and if you have a really sharp knife you can disconnect that right where it ends up here and you can put your knife right up against the spine and know that you're not gouging the stomach. Alright, so I went all the way up to where it connects and now I'm just going to work my way getting it back, freeing it up here right along the top. And if you have a good long blade like this one on an elk, you can see it's about the width of how far you got to get to get back to the spine. Now if I was on the bottom side, I wouldn't be jabbing my blade in there. I know I've got the muscle of the tenderloin that's protecting my blade from the stomach. A lot of times I'll just use my fingers to separate the soft tissue. So you can see what we're just about done here. I'm going to go that way. And I've just got a little bit left on the back there. We are just about there.
there you go. You have this great big beautiful piece of meat known as a tenderloin. And you didn't even have to get into the guts. Now, some people will ask, what about the organs? The liver, the heart, the kidney, stuff like that. This liver right here is not well. Uh, we'll check the heart. We'll take out a couple ribs when we get him on the other side. Uh, I don't know if the top of this kidney will be hit here, but anyhow, when you're doing the gutless method, if you want the organs, just all you got to do is come down on the bottom here and you can dislocate some of these rib bones where they where they attach to the sternum and you take out two of them or three of them and you can get to whatever organ you want now this is always the tricky part when you have an elk especially if you're by yourself uh, if you have this elk on a hillside steep hillside like this is you got to get him rolled over and you'd prefer not to roll him over where this exposed back strap is because if you do that you're going to end up with well a lot of dirt on there so what i'm going to do we're going to spin his head that way and i'm going to see if dale and mike can help me and we're going to see if we can roll him this way now pull him Perfect. So, what I'm going to do, folks, is just an absolute mirror of what I did on the other side. I'm going to come and I'm going to find this right here. There's the hip bone, or the top of the pelvic bone. And I'm going to come all the way here, and I'm going to get that hind quarter off there. And we already left the proof of sex on the other hind quarter, so we're good with that. And then, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make this pocket and get this front leg skinned out and get it out of there or loose so when I start coming forward with this hide it'll come out easy and then I somewhere along the way I'll have to decide where I want to cut the hide uh, usually right about there you know there's some guys that say no I go to the last rib whatever ask your taxidermist well last night you saw us get everything done concerning the gutless method with this elk and i told you that even though we weren't going to salvage the cape i was going to do it in a manner like we would salvage the cape so we're back here this morning and i'm going to show you how to remove the head real quickly without a saw whatever and in this case i'm going to continue using the exchange blade system and i'm going to use this same serrated blade that's all dirty and bloody from last night and i'm going to go back here and show you how you do this but if you can you want to use some sort of very sharp almost chiseling type point which is one of the blade options with the exchange blade system so what i'm doing is i'm tilting the head forward and the spine is pulling down this way and you can feel right there is the last vertebrae and so i'm just getting rid of all that soft tissue and getting down in there So what you're seeing is right here is the base of the skull and this works so slick when you have a serrated edge compared to a traditional edge. You get down in there, you cut the spinal cord, cut down where all this soft tissue is and you can see it's already starting to come apart. Push it that way. And once you get down in there, now you're cutting it from the top. And so if you were salvaging this cape, you would have this caped all the way out to here so that when you cut through, you weren't gonna damage the cape. So 
there you have it folks that is how you do the gutless method how you remove the head it's just knowing what steps and what cuts you got to do like i said at the beginning it doesn't matter what order you do them in just know how to do them and do them in the order that makes sense where the animal lays and over time you'll figure out what way what process what sequence works best for you thanks for watching